following lecture was produced by Glorianne Publishing, a nonprofit organization, and is one of hundreds of lectures freely available via download, podcasts, streaming radio, and transcription. These lectures range in topic and complexity in order to address the many needs of humanity. We invite you to browse our library of lectures, books, courses, and articles to find teachings that suit you. Through the support of donations, Glorian Publishing has published 40 books, hosts international retreats several times a year, offers free online courses, and many other valuable resources, available to anyone worldwide. All of this has been made possible by the financial support of listeners like you. Your donations make it possible for this free public service to reach thousands of people every day. To make a tax-deductible donation in any amount, even anonymously, visit GnosticTeachings.org. Now, with heartfelt wishes for the end of suffering for all creatures, we begin the lecture. May all beings be happy. Runes, Kaun, and Thorn. Thorn and uh, Kaun, which is also Kaun with N at the end, you can choose it either, M or N, is a uh, this, these two runes, are, as we uh, explained in other lectures, are interrelated. And uh, in this lecture, we're going to explain how, in relation with our physiology, these runes uh, act. Uh, in each one of us. As you can see, the first rune, which is thorn, is made by a vertical line and uh, an angle of 90 degrees, which is attached to it, that makes the thorn to the trunk or branch of that rune. That uh, rune is related to willpower. Is a number third, or the three, I mean, from the Futhark. As you can see, appears the number three there after the U or the Ur, and the rune Fa. And the rune uh, Kaum is the number six at the very end of the first upper line of the Futhark, which uh, relates to the letter K. The rune Thorn relates to the letter TH or letter D. That's why uh, Thorn is also called Dorn. If you observe uh, the rune Thorn, you will realize that if you flip it horizontally, the, the Thorn, the, that uh, angle of 90 degrees, you flip it horizontally, then you form the letter K with the rune Kaum. So this is how you can see how these uh, two runes are uh, related to each other. And we're going to explain, of course, because uh, both uh, runes 
look like thorns. Likewise, if you place the rune kaum to the left or the rune thorn, then you have this other rune that uh, is called ingwas, and also that uh, uh, with its shape forms the hammer of Thor, the god of thunder. Thorn, the rune thorn, is a very masculine force that develops, of course, together with the kaum, we represents the priestess in the Futhark, the woman priestess or the priestess wife of Thorn. When we observe the Futhark, <coughs> we uh, find that the first rune, Fa, which represents the father, and the second rune, Ur, which represents the mother or the uterus, together from these two runes, emerges the sun, which is thorn. That's why Donar, or Thor, uh, appears in the Edda as a son of Odin, or Wotan. And indeed, Thor is not also the son of Odin, but the son of also of Urda, the goddess Ur, uh, wife of Odin. So here we find this uh, trinity of Fa, Ur, and Thorn, father, mother, and son. When we arrive uh, at this uh, Trinity, we have to observe the tree of life in order to understand it. If you observe the tree of life, the graphic that we have there, you will see how uh, we place the rune thorn to the right side of the tree of life, remembering always that the tree of life is always a representation of the spinal column. That's why you see the back of a human being there in order to show you how these runes relate to the tree of life in their human position. To the left, we have the rune Kaum, which is formed by another graphic because the rune Kaum is uh, uh, formed by an angle of 90 degrees but also by the vertical line and by a branch that forms an angle of 45 degrees towards the right. But if you see there in the graphic that we place, the branch is towards the left because we are showing the back of the body, not the front. If you see the front of the body, of course, that rune is in this way, I mean, to the right, but from the back is to the left. And it is because in the tree of life, the right always represents the man, and the left always represents the moon. That's why we see that sun and moon, S-U-N, the sun, the thorn, and the moon, the kaum, are interrelated, a masculine and feminine forces that we have to understand, and that in other lectures we explained relate to those chords, Ida Pingala, Adam and Eve, 
since all the letters really are the expression of the word. So, we have stated that Fa, Ur, and Thorn are the Trinity, but not the first Trinity that we find above in the Tree of Life, which is formed by Keter, Chokmah, Binah, what in Christianity is said, uh, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. In uh, Hinduism, Brahma, Vishnu, Shiva. We are not referring to that trinity, but to the other one that we always explain that is formed in the Sephira Da'at, which is a union of the masculine and feminine forces of the first trinity. Remember that Da'at is formed by the division of forces that occurs in the Sephira Bina in which you see there to the left there appears another circle which symbolizes the feminine aspect of that androgenism that is called the Divine Mother Kundalini or in Kabbalah Aima Elohim. So Aima Elohim and Ava Elohim are united in that. That is what that in the Futhark is called the Rune Fa and the Rune Ur. Because it's the expression of the word. Remember that that is precisely in the larynx, in the throat, at that uh, level. Because in the beginning was the word, the word was with God, and the word was God. So when we talk about the runic alphabet, or the Futhark, we are expressing all the forms of the words, the letters, that explain the creation and the development of the human being inside of us. So, obviously, the word, the voice, expresses through the throat. This is how you have to understand how uh, these two trinities are interrelated. Because up here in the brain, we find Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. The first trinity. And remember that when we said Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we are talking about the androgenism. This is not males, like people think. Father is androgynous, the Son is androgynous, and the Holy Spirit is androgynous. So it presence here in the brain. The right part of the brain is Chokmah, the left part of the brain is Bina, and the top, related with the pineal gland, is Keter. Here's where we elaborate our thoughts, images, and when we express the word, we do it through the throat, which is feminine. But fecundating, the thought is fecundating the throat with the word. And that word that emerges from that union of Fa and Ur, or Father and Mother, is that thorn, or divine will. Because thorn, the, that thorn represents the will, the divine. That word that emerges is related, of course, with that 90 degrees angle to the left of the vertical line, <coughs> which points to Hesed. Because if you make the line from Da'at to Hesed and to Tifereth, you make that angle of 90 degrees to the spinal column, then you find the rune thorn formed by Hesed and Tifereth. From Da'at, Hesed, Tifereth. That is what we call good will in Kabbalah. And of course, that's why that good will expresses us first to Hesed, which is the innermost, the spirit inside of us, the monad. And later on, if we perform what we had to perform, expresses itself to Tifereth, which is the human soul. 
That is thorn. That's why when you see the figure or the shape of that human being is making the rune, but it's giving the back to us in order to show that the right arm is the one that has to be on the waist, the, I mean the hand of the waist, in order to make that thorn with the body. But you have to understand that when you are making it, you are uniting Chesed and Tifereth to Da'at. Because in Da'at is father and mother. Father and mother, what in India is called Shiva, Shakti. Understand that. Because in India, the first triangle is called Brahma, Vishnu, Shiva. But when you talk about the duality of the Holy Spirit, the duality of the creative force, sexual force, you said Shiva Shakti. And from Shiva Shakti emerges that uh, uh, archetype that in India is called uh, that uh, uh, boy with the head of an elephant, Ganesh. Ganesh. But that is Ganesh, but that's India. But we're talking here about the food arc, of course. And then we find Odin with his wife in the throat, making Thor, the god of thunder. That god of thunder is the Holy Spirit. That uh, Shiva Shakti or Odin with his wife are also the Holy Spirit. This is how you have to comprehend when we talk about the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is that uh, part of the creative force of God that contains the Father and the Son, Keter and Chokmah, within. But then we divide, it divides into two, into the duality, which is Shiva Shakti, Mother, Father. Then the Trinity expresses itself through the Father and through the Mother. So, if the Father has Father, Son, and Holy Spirit within, the Mother also has Father, Son, and Holy Spirit within. Because this Trinity is what we call the Three Amatsikamno, the Law of Three that creates, that all of us have it in our body. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Father in the head, Son in the heart, the Holy Spirit in the sex. So the three brains that we have. But in this case, myself, I'm masculine. If I want to engender, I need a female. But have also Father in the head, the Son in the, in the heart, and the Holy Spirit in the sex. But united sexually, we create a son. You see? How the Trinity, from that Trinity emerges another Trinity. It's how you have to see it in order to understand it. But the one that emerges from that duality is the Holy Spirit. The power of the Holy Spirit. <coughs> that Holy Spirit, which is the outcome of that duality, is called Ruach. Elohim in the Bible which is translated as the Spirit of God but really Ruach means spirit and also wind so when we talk about the father and mother together, we said Elohim. This is how it's written in the Bible. In the beginning, Elohim created the heaven and the earth. Ela is goddess, and El is God in Hebrew. So when you said Ela, you are pronouncing it first, L, 
masculine, ela, feminine, and the end, I am, Elohim, is plural. So you are implying more than two. I mean, more than one. Two, three, four, five. Elohim means gods and goddesses. But in this case, Elohim points to the duality. Father, mother, the two of them together in the word. See? The very word Elohim is father, mother, plural. That's why the son of that Elohim is called Ruach Elohim. And this is very important to comprehend. Because that Ruach Elohim, or Spirit of God, Spirit of that Elohim is inside of us. It's our innermost, our own spirit, our inner being, the reality inside of us that is waiting for us in order to work with it. And that's why in our lectures we always point that the Ruach Elohim is the Holy Spirit, an unfoldment of the Holy Spirit. The Divine Mother is the Holy Spirit, and the Father is also the Holy Spirit. That's the Trinity. You have to understand that because we are talking about creation. And creation always relates to the Holy Spirit, Shiva, and his wives. Because in Hinduism you find the many wives of Shiva which represent different unfoldments of that feminine force in the universe. <coughs> so, the rune thorn is showing us that. But remember that the Holy Spirit needs a feminine aspect in order to create and this is how the rune Kaum appears, which is the number six. And that rune Kaum uh, represents the priestess wife or the feminine aspect that unfolds and descends and becomes what the Bible calls Eve. Remember that in the beginning was, was, uh, Adam was created, androgynous. That Adam is a Ruach Elohim, spirit of God, which is above. The reality, the true man, androgynous. But that, for, from that androgynous being appears the feminine. Or in other words, Elohim takes Eve from Adam. In other words, Elohim takes Kaum from thorn. You see that? It's easy to see. If you take the 90 uh, degrees angle of the rune thorn out of the vertical line, and then the rune Kaum emerges, which is only a 90 degrees rune. But to the left, and that's why the other symbol of the Kaum is a vertical line with a branch to the left. Which is the feminine aspect of Adam. So that's why Thorn and Kaum are together, intermingled, in order to do the work. This is how uh, we see it. And, uh, of course... We find that explanation in what the Bible says. We have the graphic there in the website where you see how God, this uh, picture or graphic made by William Blake, is making or pointing at the Elohim the Ruach Elohim within the sun, the solar light, the cosmic Christ, and uh, making or starting to make 
the universe. If you observe, from his hand emerges the room Kaum or Thorn, either way. So, of course, that two lines are also the representation of the square and the compass of the masonry. That is a symbol. The G of Genesis, generation, Gnosis, if you want. In between, the thorn and the kaum, that's the symbol of the masons. And of course, the symbol, in, in order to explain how in the beginning God was geometrizing, making the universe with geometry, which begins with G. Because the world is geometry. That's why it is written that in the beginning was the world and the world was with God. And the world was God. So the book of Genesis states, in the beginning, the earth was without form and void. And darkness was upon the face of the deep. And the spirit of the Elohim moved upon the face of the waters. The Ruach Elohim moved upon the face of the waters. That Ruach Elohim, of course, is this uh, represented by this uh, elder who is there utilizing the two runes. That show us that if we want to perform what is written in Genesis, we had to utilize our willpower, thorn, and kaum together. And that creation that the Genesis describes in seven chapters occurs inside of us. I mean in seven days. Because this is in the first chapter, together with the second. The seven days, of course, are the action of that Ruach Elohim inside of us. That means that if you don't know the clue for your Ruach Elohim, for your innermost, for your spirit to do that, that will, uh, is not going to be done. You have to know the clue. Because that Ruach Elohim is the Holy Spirit that has to descend into your physical body and to start doing that. Which is the creation described in Genesis in which the outcome or the end of it is Adam. The androgynous within you. Commonly, when people uh, utilize their sexual energy, they do it in the way that we explained in the previous lecture with the Itoklanos principle. The Itoklanos principle is the animal principle or the animal way which I do not need you to explain because all of you know. In the same way that a dog, that a horse, that a bull multiply and create, also we do it. But the way in order to create with the Ruach Elohim is a human way that we have to learn. Which is, a, I told you in another lecture, the fullest nitam niand principle that we have to learn. And this is precisely what we are pointing here. In order for us to enter into the fullest nitam niand principle, which is a human level in which we create 
little by little, all the seven days of Genesis inside is the way in which the Ruach Elohim works over or above the waters. Those waters, of course, as is explained in the verse 20 and 21 of the book of Genesis, states, And Elohim said, Let the waters bring forth abundantly the moving creature that hath life. But in Kabbalah, in Hebrew, it's called nefesh. The moving creature that has life. The animal force that all of us have in the sex. Nefesh. What waters? The sexual waters. And fall that may fly above the earth in the open firmament of heaven. The birds that appear in heaven are the outcome of a sexual transmutation. When the alchemists extract that animal force from the sperm in the very sexual act. So that solar force rises to heaven, the head, and it start creating <coughs> in another octave, superior octave, inside, psychologically speaking. The body of willpower, which is the outcome of the transmutation of the sexual libido. That's why it says, a fall that may fly above the earth in the open firmament of heaven. And Elohim created great whales and every living creature that moveth which the waters brought forth abundantly after their kind and every winged fall after his kind. And God saw that it was good. God, which is the same Elohim, saw that it was good. Because good is to the right and bad to the left. It's the action of the Ruach Elohim inside of us. Now, the great whales are elements of fish force, fish force, that is developed inside of us. Because when we talk about Chesed, the Holy Spirit, our own innermost inside of us, you have to understand that it's related with water, with the water element. Every time that you read in the Bible, water immediately relates to your innermost inside. That's why in the very beginning it says that the Ruach Elohim was floating above the waters. Because it's the element that it works, it works with. The waters are the sexual, creative waters in our body. So, in the sexual waters, we find the power of God, represented by the well. Remember how Jonah was swallowed by the well. And in it, he develops and became a prophet. To be swallowed by the well is to be swallowed by the sexual force in the alchemical manner. You enter there in order to be developed as a human being, as a prophet inside your own particular waters. But within that waters, unfortunately, we find the every living creature that moveth. Every living creature that moveth in the animal kingdom. Because through evolution we come from the animal kingdom. So in the sexual waters we find every living creature that moves. 
that the Kabbalists in the Zohar call Lilith. Lilith comes from the word Laila, night, darkness, obscurity. Lilith is the mother of desire. With this, we have to understand that in the animal kingdom, Lilith, desire, acts freely. According to the different periods in nature, in order to multiply in any animal species. That's why the Bible says, after his kind, kind in Hebrew is mina. Mina means sexual force. If we had to translate that correctly, we had to say it after his sexual force. But kind is also related because each one of us yes, has a different kind of race according to his own sexual force. The sexual force is the one that creates that, different types, kinds. But when you read after his kind, it's of course after his sexual energy. Mina. This is how you say it in Hebrew. So this is how you see how that living creature that moves in the waters is in us. This is called desire. Sexual desire. Anyone has that. Any animal has that. So Elohim brought that from the, from the waters. Meaning that, in this case, the water symbolizes the creative force, the sexual force, not only in our level, but in the animal kingdom, in the plant kingdom, and in the mineral kingdom. In the mineral kingdom, the waters are magnetism, electricity. In the plant kingdom is the sap of the trees, the pollen. That's how you see that water in which God the Elohim is making uh, nature to multiply. So this is how you have to understand when we talk about water. In Hinduism, it's called Akasha. That Akasha inundates the space, the cosmos, inundates our body, inundates the plants, the minerals. It's everywhere. And Elohim is always working with it, creating. That's the intelligence of creation. So there you have it. How, unfortunately, within us, we have that uh, force of desire. But we had to transform desire into willpower. That is the clue. Because when we enter into these studies, we know that we had to transmute the sexual force if what we want is our innermost to create the astral body, the mental body, in the causal body, because that is the goal. When you reach the causal body, it's because you already have the astral and the mental body. When you have that, then in the causal world appears the face of Veronica. The sacred cloth of Veronica, which is uh, represented uh, in the Christian Gospels. Master Samael on the Or said, of course, in, in the magic runes about the rune thorn. 
he explains, when I was born in the causal world, or better said, the parallel universe of the conscious will, then the sacred cloth of Veronica shone upon the altar of the temple. Many heads crowned with thorns that are chiseled in stone are found to be related to the age of bronze. A cult to the god of thorns existed. Such thorns, when treated with consideration and judiciously examined, present to us with clarity the symbolic figure of the rune Thor. In these sacred mysteries of the, of the thorn cult, speci special practices were given in order to develop the conscious will. Because thorn or thorns signifies willpower. Remember, Gnostic brethren, that our motto is Telema, willpower. And of course, we had to develop the conscious will. So the goal is that when th that face appears in the sixth dimension, which is Tifereth, related with the rune thorn, then behold the man, or as we say in Latin, Ece homo. Of course, that thorn on the head of the initiate symbolizes the way in which you control your animal mind with will. It is not easy. You have to bleed in order to control your animal nature. Because that animal nature abides in your mind, in your heart, and in your sex. That's why is an other symbols of Jesus or the Christ pointing the heart with another Corn of, uh, a crown of thorns. Because this is how you control also your emotions. Animal emotions. Not the path of willpower. And that's why the rune thorn is the one. The will, the divine will that controls the waters. The sexual waters inside of us control our mind in order to control Lilith which is the animal desire that we inherit from the animal kingdom and then each one of us has dark when I said this uh, is coming into my mind the word void which I was showing you in the quotation that in the beginning the earth was without form and void and darkness was upon the face of the deep the darkness is Laila, Lilith void Vohu Vohu that's how you say it in, in, in Hebrew Bohu. And uh, the children of the void is called uh, Yalda. Or oh, Yald. Yalda Baoth. There's a word there in, in the Gnostic uh, writings. Yalda Baoth. The word is Yalda, which means child, and Bohu, the child of the void. But it's plural, because when you place the letter Tav or T at the end of the word, Yalda about, you are saying the children of the void, because it's plural. Well, the children of the void has two uh, interpretations. What well, that Yalda about? First, the positive interpretation of Jaldabaoth means the children of the void, of the emptiness that emerged in the beginning from the darkness. And those are, of course, the uh, cosmocreators. 
or what we call the demiurge. The demiurge, those individuals that have the power of creation in themselves, have developed that. Call it angels. The angels of God. Yaldabaoth. But also has also this other negative interpretation. Which is the outcome of desire, of darkness. The children of desire. Yaldabaoth. Comes into my mind the word also Sabaot, which means army. So the children of desire, which are many, are represented in Christianity by the seven sins. The first one that appears is lust. Then anger, pride, envy, gluttony, laziness, greed. Seven. From those seven, which are the head or the dragon of seven heads, emerge a lot of psychological aggregates or children of desire. That's why in P.C. Sophia you find Yaldabaoth referring to those uh, hosts of creators that appear in the beginning. But also the negative aspect is another host that appear inside of us because of desire. From Lilith, in other words. So in other words, inside of us, we have two armies. First the army of God inside, and then the army of the devil. Lilith, desire, inside of us. We are divided in two, positive and negative. And you know that. Observe this humanity. It's a lot of good people where the Ruach Elohim shone through them, but also the same people have negative aspects. Some worship Lilith. Other ones to destroy the earth and to work for the Father. Inside of us. That is a, a, a word. A battle that each one of us each one of us has. Many of this humanity prefer to worship Lilith. The mother of desire. And Yaldabaoth. All of those children that emerge from that desire which are many defects, vices, and errors that all of us have. But here, we have to destroy that. That is the doctrine in order to develop the real army, the good Sabaoth, or the good Yaldabaoth, in order to become part of the army of the voice, and that's precisely what uh, we have to understand when we read the Gnostics, uh, Gnostic Gospels. Because they often mention Yaldabaoth, but it's dual. And remember, Yalda. Yalda, child. Child of the void. Has two interpretations. We know how to read in order to understand it. We will say two creative forces. One that great for good and the other good for desire, which is Lilith. When I mention this, it comes into my mind also Gurdjieff. And uh, there is a word that also points at this. Gurdjieff call it Poisoninoskirian vibrations. Poison. Ninos. Reminds me, Ninos. Yalda, same thing. Now, the word Kirian in Irish means uh, the offspring of darkness. With 
K-I-R-I-A-N, Kirian. Poison, of course, is desire. Give me an example of poison. Is Yuristira in the Mahabharata asked by a god of the lake? See, the god of the lake asked him, give me uh, an example of poison. And he immediately said, desire. Perfect. Desire is a poison inside of us. But we have to transform that poison into something that will be positive for us. Poison in Hebrew is sam. So that sam has to be transformed. Because that sam, poison or desire in the animal kingdom is what the Sohar call Samael Lilith. Because Samael Lilith is in the liver. I mean, Samael rules the liver, Mars. And above the liver, we have the gold bladder, which is related to Lilith. Bitter. And all of us have problems with the liver and with the gold bladder. So that's why the Zohar called Samael Lilith, which is inside of us. But this science, this doctrine teaches how to transform some elite into that Jacob, which appears in Tifereth, thanks to the forces of Samael, which is the forces of creation. That's why in many Gnostics uh, or Gnostic uh, Gospels mention Samael as the god of the blind. It relates, of course, to the animal kingdom. Because any cosmo creator works with the duality. So, we uh, talked very extensive about Lilith in the previous lecture. And how it relates to the black moon. Or the black forces. Because in creation, we need all, always the forces of the moon. Jehovah works with the forces of the moon. But unfortunately, uh, the dark forces of the moon also intervene in creation, which is Lilith, desire. And that happens inside of each one of us. It's a great battle that we have to do. Or the Mahabharata, as we say. Great war in order to win. So behold there. How these uh, forces <coughs> of willpower act in us. And uh, how Gurdjieff names them. Poisoninoskirian vibrations. It's nothing else than the forces of desire from the darkness part of us. And it is because in order for us to do, to create what we have to create, the Father of all delights gave us the Exioehari. This is how Gurdjieff also called the sexual energy. X C O E Ari X O E Ari. This is this is E X I E A R Y X O E Ari. The X O E Ari is a zimen. Whether in the feminine body or in the masculine body. Semen for us in the Gnostic doctrine is in both bodies. Feminine semen and masculine semen. So this, uh, this is the exiohari. I believe this is how it is spelled. And uh, this exiohari has 
the power of creation. With it, we can transform ourselves. Imagine how powerful is that substance in the body. When we mingle our sexual force with a feminine force, man and woman, we create. Unfortunately, only we know how to do it in the itoklanos manner, in the animal manner. But if you learn how to create in the divine manner, and then you understand why the serpent said to Eve, if you know and know how to eat from the tree of good and evil, if you learn how to know, not like animal, then you will be like the Elohim, knowing good and evil. And Eve took the fruit and ate, but in the Toklanos manner. And instead of creating something divine, he created Cain, a killer. And since that time, this humanity with Cain, that entity inside, which is the outcome of Lilith, you see how in the Gnostic doctrine, they talk about how Adam had sex with Lilith. Or that, Lee, that Adam had two wives, Lilith and Nahema. So when Adam went into the tree of good and evil, which is sex, the mystery of sex, and wanted to do it in the divine manner, unfortunately, Lilith was stronger than him. It means desire. Or in other words, Dalaila. Which is also the same thing. What is stronger than Samson? And the outcome was Cain. An offspring of darkness. Cain killed Abel. Our own essence. Inside of us. That was the outcome. And uh, after that. Many niños. Ninos. Came. That poison humanity, poisoninos, kirien, elements inside of us. The outcome of desire. Or in other words, in the Hebrew manner or Aramaic manner, we will say, yaldabaoth. The children of darkness or the void. And this is precisely our situation, which we are right now. In the past, many investigators of the doctrine of the Gnostics and that they found that the sexual energy was the clue in order to transform psychologically and spiritually. They were looking for the doctrine and they found that the semen was a philosophical stone, the mystery of transformation. But unfortunately, they err the way, and they became celibate, thinking that by saving the energy through celibacy was the way. And this is how many monks, monasteries were uh, born in the past. With monks and nuns that renounce sex without understanding that in order to create physically, you need to mix the two exoheharis in order to have a child. And in order to create in the divine manner, you also have to mix the two exoheharis, but in the alchemical manner. And for that, they had to renounce desire to avoid in the very sexual act. The animal spasm, the filthy orgasm of animals. Because only animals do that. We are also intellectual animals. That's why everybody uh, does that. But those monks, those searchers, found that mystery. Not only in Christianity. <coughs> you find monks in Buddhism and many other religions. That know that the mystery is in the sex. 
But they forgot that the sexual force has a creative power. And if you don't know how to utilize that creative power in the wise way, and if you renounce the animal way, because they renounce to the animal act, sexual act, they are renouncing completely to multiply themselves normally as the animals do. But they don't transmute the sexual force. They didn't learn how to transform that semen into energy. In the beginning, of course, those single men and women that still were not married were learning how to liberate the creative force of the semen through breathing exercises we call pranayama and many other techniques to liberate that force because the semen is created every 24 hours in the physical organism and we, if we don't apply that in the animal manner well that energy has to do something inside of us because it's creative and since we have a lot of desire inside obviously Lilith take over of it that's why it is written that uh, Kabbalistically symbolically in the Zohar that after Adam created Cain with Eve and Cain killed Abel and Cain was expelled from Eden he said why am I going to create children for death I refuse to do the sexual act the Zohar says that for 130 years Adam never touched Eve but obviously the creative force was forming the physical body with what he eat, or what he ate, I mean, thought, and all the energies that enter into the body. So that creative energy started to mingled with Lilith and Nahema. Two spiritual forces, we will say, two negative forces that created within Adam, Yaldabaoth, or within that humanity because Adam represents that humanity or Lemurian humanity as we explained in the previous lecture so then uh, those elements we have elements psychological elements psychological aggregates within us that are the outcome of Lilith and the other psychological aggregates that are the outcome of Nahema negative spiritual forces which are animal because we do not know how to handle the sexual force whether we abuse of it or reach that uh, practice which is called celibacy which is 100% negative I'm referring to that celibacy in which the single person does not know even how to transmute how to transform the zeming into energy that they, they refuse the sexual act but they don't do anything with their sexual force they have nocturnal pollutions and uh, in the Middle East for instance I mean in the Middle Ages correct me here Gurdjieff talks about that in his uh, Tales from Beelzebub there were monks that were developing a certain type of psychological attitudes and physically also physiological because of the retention of the semen, their celibacy. The first outcome of that was that we're monks, like we're like pigs, very fat. This is precisely what the sexual force were creating physically. The second was other type of monks that were very skinny, very thin. But inside of these monks, we're creating two types of psychological uh, neg negative uh, vibrations. Because the skinny ones were creating or developing the poisoninoskirian vibrations. Meaning that the sexual energy inside of them 
were developing a, a type of creation negative coming from desire and fortifying their ego. So they became cynics in the inside and fanatics in the outside. So on the outside, they were very fanatic. And on the inside, they were planning things, how to kill people in the name of God. This poison in Oskirian vibrations eventually developed the Kundabafer organ, the tail of Satan, which is that negative fire from the coccyx downwards. Instead of the fire going from the sex up to the spinal column in order to develop the tree of life instead of the inner moss doing that creation that we find in Genesis the energy was going from the coccyx down to clip off to hell and fortifying those elements animal elements that we have related with desire of course the fanaticism that those monks in the Middle Ages developed was extremely awful. So, when we discover the mystery of the sexual force, we have to know how to control it and how to manage it, how to transform it. If we are single with pranayamas, with exercises in order to put it in activity, if we are married in the Maituna, Saha Maituna, sexual tantric, without orgasm. In the full as Nitamnian manner, as we explained. So, those negative aspects, or Yaldabaot, that we, we call, and uh, the poison is Kyrian vibrations, developed. In that manner, when we are in celibacy. And then the developing that cynicism, the cynics, and also the so called uh, child molesters, because desire is fed in the very wrong manner, and having type of sexual act, which is, of course, not only opposite to the spirit, but opposite to the same nature. Because normal sexual act in the Toklanus manner, animal manner, is male, female. Our normal is male with male or female with female. And other type of degeneration that is very common in this day and age because of the sexual aberration that all of us are involved in it. We have to learn how to get rid of Lilith and Nahema inside of us, the animal desire. We are not going anywhere but to hell with it or the inferior dimensions of nature. The infra, clipoth, called in Kabbalah. There is another phenomena that moves the psyche in this humanity. And it is called the... Uh, Solionensius. We explained in the previous lecture how the comets relate with the creative positive force of the universe and that approach all these big albums that we call planets or suns in order to fecundate that force and to multiply life in the surface of any planet. So, there is a planet, or uh, in other words, a comet, that is called the Comet Sulni. Or Solni, if you want. That comet uh, travels in the solar system. And every time that uh, it's approaching another solar system, which is close to our solar system, then the sun, the center of that solar system, emits vibrations in order to push it away, in order not to collide with it. When that sun, Baleoto, is called, when the sun Baleoto emerge, uh, uh, 
emits those vibrations, then all the suns next to it have to do the same thing in order to have a normal vibrations in the cosmos. A balance. Among those suns is our sun, the center of our solar system, emits those vibrations too. In order to level the cosmic forces in our solar system. But when, he, when the sun emits that vibration, obviously, that vibration is received in all of the planets. Because all the planets rotate around the sun, and the sun keeps them rotating around it with its vibrations, with its forces. So when an extra force is coming into the planet, then, of course, the organic life on the surface receive an extra fuel the mineral kingdom the animal kingdom plant kingdom and we of course we receive that force in the psyche inside unfortunately in this planet earth we have the innermost our spirit but we have yelled about the children of darkness inside of us. And we receive that, logically, the vibrations, the solar force, give us inside the, the longing for spiritual liberation in order to, for us to act and look for the self-realization of the being. But when the ego takes it, then the ego wants also liberation. Freedom! And revolutions happen. And all the people, of course, with more ego than, than the being, than the innermost, start making revolutions. Wars. Civil wars. First, second wars. So the sol leonensius is a law that appears in order to help all the kingdoms and every planet. But for us, the soul in angels is a damnation if we don't know how to handle it. Because if the ego takes that vibration, and then, behold, desire develops extremely. Like in this day and age, many comets have passed, and that soul in angels have worked in this part of the solar system. And what is the outcome of it? Many people that appear in TV saying, I am out of the closet, applaud me, I am an homosexual, or I am a lesbian. That's sad. And people applaud that, because they say that they are honest, or dishonest with themselves. And if somebody talks against that, it's a prejudice. You can talk against alcoholism, which is good. Alcohol is bad, but don't talk about homosexuality or lesbianism because then you are signed there in the blacklist. Because everybody is worshipping Lilith, desire. And we are teaching here how to destroy Lilith. Because if you keep working Lilith, desire, the solunensius, the vibrations will take you in order to create more and more evil things inside of you. To make of your psyche negative. And you will sink more and more into the infra dimensions. If you don't want to have that fate, you have to work against your Lilith and your Nahemai inside of us, in front of you. And thinking that outside, this humanity is worshipping Lilith and Nahema. Nahema is adultery and fornication. Lilith is a mother of homosexuality, lesbianism, pederastism, and many aberrations, sexual aberration inside. Was that flourished? We are really bad. Let me show you now. What the master explains about the Rune Kaum. The Rune Kaum with its cabalistical six vibrates with the maximum intensity within the sphere of Venus. 
the planet of love. Six, because it's the sixth rune in the food arc. It's related with love. When you talk about love, it comes into my mind, they are canon sixth of the tarot, the lovers. When you find sometime in the canon sixth, called indecision, the human soul whose legs are sank into the water. And from the waist up, is on the surface of the water. To the left is Lilith, and to the right is the Divine Mother, the Priestess, symbol of the Kaum. So it's in between. The human soul is always in between the two forces. When I said Lilith, comes into my mind that the graphic of Lilith appears always as a whore. A naked prostitute to the left side. And to the right side is a woman dressed as a priestess. And is standing in her, her hand to the human soul. But the human soul is turning to the left. Identified with the neckness of Lilith, the whore. When I said this, also I remember the book of Genesis. It is written... That when Adam and Eve ate from the forbidden fruit of desire, because they didn't know how to eat it in the divine manner, so they ate it in the Toklanus manner, animal, they discovered that they were naked. That nakedness is related with Lilith. In other words, the filthiness. Because they were identified with the physicality. And this is what happened in this day and age. All of us are identified with the physicality. Nahema. The nakedness of Lilith. And of course, to teach now the mind had to see the physical body without identifying with it, without developing desire, is very difficult. And that is only possible to learn in the sexual act and in meditation. It's not by avoiding the sexual act that we are going to control desire. The desire, sexual desire that we have in abundance, we have to be... Uh, to to transform it into willpower. And that willpower, of course, is a rune thorn. When you place your right arm and you connect your chesed with your tifereth from that, that is knowledge. The tree of knowledge of good and evil is related with that. With that rune, you fortify your willpower. Because there are many students, alchemists, that want to transmute the sexual energy in the very sexual act. But they are weak. Lilith controls them easily, their own desire. Of course, uh, in the man, in the male, that's very difficult. The female is not that difficult because she's passive. But there are females also that have the problem with the transmutation when they want to learn. That's why uh, the Master Samael on the Lord teaches. He says, O oh God of mind, remember, beloved reader, that roses without thorns do not exist. You know this. The rose, the red rose, symbol of the soul that comes from the mud. When you see a white rose, that's the purity of the soul. For instance, an elemental, which is innocent. But we, we very sank into the mud of desire. 
So if we learn how to transmute the sexual energy with our willpower, then the rose, the, the soul will bloom out of us, but with red color, which is the color of passion. So that beautiful red rose will come, the rosy cross. The cross is a symbol of the vertical line with a horizontal line, which is the sexual act. When you trans transmute the sexual matter, and then the red rose emerges. But remember that there are no roses, roses without thorns. You have to exercise willpower. That's why the ones that enter and try to transmute and to emerge, if they don't have too much thorns in themselves, they cannot control that sexual desire. They have to exercise and to practice the rune thorn. Thorn, says the Master Samael, is also the phallus, the volitive principle of sexual magic. There is a need by means of the phallus to in intelligently to accumulate the seminal energy and when it is refrained and transmuted, it is converted into telema, willpower. So arm yourself with a willpower like steel. Remember, beloved reader, that without the thorn which pierces or sticks, the spark does not jump. The light does not emerge. That means that if you in the sexual act do not exercise, does not exercise the willpower in order not to reach the spasm, the orgasm, and to transmute that force into light, it doesn't emerge. Usually many try to do that and they succumb because desire is stronger. So the, you, you have to practice, of course, the ruined uh, thorn in order to develop that willpower. But you see how the right arm is there, pointing, as we explain in the Tree of Life, your chesed, your tifereth, your human soul will receive the strength in that, which is the Tree of Good and Evil in a very sexual act. So in a military position, on our feet, firm and facing towards the east, place your right arm in such a way that your hand will remain resting upon your waist or hips. Thus, performing the form of this rune, now you must sing the mantrix syllables with strength, because the T beats in your consciousness. Ta, te, ti, to, tu, like that, <clears throat> and repeat it as many times as you want. In front of the sun, the solar force comes into your psyche, concentrate in your innermost, chesed, and your human soul in the heart, and the tree of good and evil in your throat that needs to be controlled. Ta, te, ti, to, tu. <coughs> Very well concentrated when the sun is rising. And then you will develop that willpower. Because it's what we need. Willpower. In order to control desire. Without willpower, you cannot control it. It is easy to talk about that. But when we are in the sexual act, it's when we have to prove. It says, many Christians, they hide behind the cross. They sign themselves with the cross. You know, the seal with the cross in order to protect themselves. But when they are tested in the sexual act, which is a real cross when God is present, they fail. They don't protect themselves. Lilith enters and takes them to hell. And they fail. So, ta, te, ti, to, tu, in order to, to develop the willpower. Because the Master explains When sexually excited, the woman 
has the power to transplant the synthetic principles of the 12 salts to the larynx of the man. This is how such an organ acquires hermaphrodite principles that later give the innermost the power to create by means of the word. That's the magic clue. And below, the combination of the igneous principles between the man and the woman are also intimately related with a sequence of salty interchanges that prepare the feminine larynx as an angelic creative organ. This is how we develop the power of the Elohim. Because the Elohim created with the power of the throat. Remember, in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. You have to develop that power of the Word. And God said, let there be light. And the light was because He said it. All of us, we like to have that power. Well, this is the way to develop it. And a very sexual act. But you have to renounce what you are. And what is what we are? Animals. Three brains we have. Intellectual brain, emotional brain, and motor sexual instinctual brain. We are in the times of the end. That's why this doctrine is given to those animals that do not want to become or to, to be intellectual animals, but to human beings, to be human beings. And the clue is there. But between husband and wife, not with Nahema, not with adultery, because adultery doesn't work. Listen, within the sexual mantras of our organic laboratory, the explosions of passionate fire combine certain ethereal, astral, mental, volitive, conscious, and divine arcana. This occurs in order to elaborate certain igneous elements whose substantial principles belong to the innermost, with the ardent fire of the erotic thirst. So that is normal. It's not that you're going to renounce sex. You have to have that thirst. But you have to concentrate in your inner must. Because if you concentrate in Lilith, then the outcome is the orgasm, the spasm, and the loss of that force that you want to accumulate. The woman accumulates a very large quantity of elemental fire from nature while in the state of sexual excitement. And when her fire is combined with the erotic magnetic of her husband, then it engenders certain cosmic powers whose tremendous explosions open the spinal chambers. The 33 chambers, or 33 degrees that you have to develop in your spinal column, your 33 vertebrae. The boiling passionate fires of men and women, when mutually and erotically combined, create truly ardent tempests that disturb the atmosphere and cause the tenebrous ones, who are the scorts of each chamber, to go mad. Who are those tenebrous that are the scorts of each chamber? They're inside of you. The children of Lilith. Yaldabaoth. Inside of you. When you stop feeding your lust, your lust got mad against you. All of a sudden, you are angry for nothing. Your ego wants to be fed, but you are trying to stop your feeding your animal nature and to do it your spiritual nature through the sexual act, which is the very bottom, which is the very origin of your animal level. And now you have to create a spiritual to become a human being. That's why it says here, these submerged entities attack the intrepid ones by defending the fires whose synthetic and scientific principles are enclosed in the 33 internal chambers of our spinal column. That are lost attackers mentally, not only in the very sexual act, after you perform and succeed in transmuting, you have to be aware because in the outside world, your lust, your anger, your pride will say, okay, you transmuted that, but I'm going to steal that from you. And all of a sudden you become angry. And so that transmuted energy goes for your, for your anger. 
or you are in the street walking and you see a beautiful woman walking past and you said, oh, beautiful forms. Let us admire the beauty of this woman. Then your lust. He says, oh, huh. well, you are not feeling me in the sexual act, but I am going to do it through your heart. Because it is enough to lust for a woman in your heart in order to commit adultery. That's what Jesus said. So this is not easy. You have to meditate. You have to comprehend your ego. That is the path. And you advance. Because you have to save your energy. And your animal ego, your, those entities that exist within you, attack you. In your dreams. In your daily life. It's not that somebody will attack you outside in this path. People think, oh, the enemies of the alchemists are outside. The people that don't believe in this. No, no, no. Who cares if they believe in it or not? Those enemies are inside you. If you don't conquer yourself, you cannot conquer outside. Napoleon, says Master Zamael, conquer many males in the battlefield. That's easy. But he will not succeed by fighting against himself. That's difficult. Because the battle, only you know. If you are a conqueror, a hero, or you're just faking you are nobody. Because the outcome comes inside. The development of chakras, virtues, powers. When you know how to save that energy. Because that energy is the energy of God. That is creating within you. The prophet. That's why this Tenebrous one defend their rights. And for this reason they qualify as a thieves of powers. Many times in internal planes, they go there and accuse you. Or they utilize other people to tell them that you are a thief. You are stealing. In this day and age, they said, oh, they are plagiarists. They are taking the wisdom from other authors. So they are thieves. And they are boasting that they are powerful. They are just thieves. Also, those people that are accused like that are precisely people that are slaves of Lilith. And because they are slaves of Lilith and Nehemiah, well, they work for them. So they accuse all the alchemists of thieves, of plagiarists, etc. Well, you don't identify. You keep working ahead because if your egos are accusing you, other people are going to accuse you. So, remember, read the Gospels of Jesus and you will see how he was accused. By all those hypocrites that were inside of him and outside of him. Each chamber is strongly defended by tenebrous legions. It is necessary to defeat these tenebrous ones with the edge of the sword in order to take each chamber by force. Now the devotees of the path will understand why Christ said that heaven is taken by force. So to go and to be born again in the causal plane with a thorn, with the body of willpower, is not a, a kind of I reach my hand and I accept Jesus as my savior. That's easy. You have to take heaven by force. By using willpower. It's inside of you. It's not by believing. You can believe in whatever you want. But in the moment of the action, in the very sexual act, is when you have to prove if you love God or Lilith. Easy. That's why the true alchemists are difficult to find. Fanatics, believers, millions. But in the moment of the cross, they fail. So here we are delivering the clues. You know, for all of them that love the Lord... Because all of them love the Lord with a lot of heart, sincerity. It's good. But they don't have the clue. Now that they have the clue, okay, love the Lord. Because the Lord is creative force, is a solar force in our sexual lands. So, the mysterious rune Ka represents the priestess wife and also the flaming sword with complete exactitude. When you are working for the first time 
in the magisterium of fire, which is a sexual act. And when you learn how to transmute, and when you succeed of taking the sexual force from the coccyx to the pineal gland, and then internally for the first time, he says, you are a knight. You are Artirman. You see? Ar, rune R, rune Tyr, and the rune man, Artirman. We translate it into English, it's Arthur. A new king. You took the sword out of the stone. That stone is the, the philosophical stone of Yesod, your sexual force. And then the, the, the sword emerged from there in all your spinal column. That's the flaming sword that gives you access to Eden. Then you have the sword. Now you understand why Kaum or Kaun also symbolizes the sword. Because in the very sexual act is how you have to control your woman. Now listen this carefully. Kaum is the woman. Your physical body, your physicality, which is Malkut, is feminine. Control your woman if you are single. Transmute your sexual energy. Do pranayamas, exercises. Don't do celibacy. Avoid, of course, if you are not married, to be in adultery. But transmute. That will liberate that sexual force and you will develop the nine uh, initiations of minor mysteries. This is how you advance by controlling your woman. That woman, remember, in the beginning is a whore. That's that whore that the book of Revelation talks about, where we find all these defects, vices, and errors, a physicality, a psyche. But we want to fight against that whore. She's Lilith inside of us. And like, likewise, male or female, you work with your woman, with your physicality. That's the woman. That's Mary Magdalene. And eventually, if you are faithful to your inner must, you will find your other partner, your twin soul. Twin in the sense that is following the same path that you are following. When you marry this woman or this man, remember that willpower is masculine and that force is feminine. Either you are a man or a woman, when you're united, you have to work now with your woman again and with a woman of the other, of your wife or your husband. And this is how Mary Magdalene, the whore, becomes holy. But you are that. And in the other way, the woman itself, feminine aspect, represents Kaum in itself. Because this rune is feminine. So therefore, when we talk about the woman, the feminine body is also Kaum. But remember that your body is also Kaum. And your willpower is masculine. So, when you marry, your wife should be a priestess wife. Because you become a priest of fire. In a very sexual act, you are controlling and manipulating the elements. And your wife also. Priest and priestess. Shiva Shakti. The holy matrimony. And you develop that. And with that, not only the man received the sword, but also the woman. Remember, there are women warriors. When I talk with a rune ka, kaum, comes into my mind, kundri. That woman that Parsifal defeats in a sexual act. Kundri says, all men are weak. They fail with me. But then Parsifal appears, which is the phallus per se, and they fit her in a very sexual act. And then she gets in love with him because he's his hero. All men fail with me except Parsifal. And Parsifal receives 
his knight, his sword, becomes a knight of the round table. And that's precisely the power of, of the woman. The woman accumulates that fire in the very sexual act. And we attract that, we transmute that. The men also, but the female body receives more. And a woman, feminine, feminine body, when it's exciting, the sexual act accumulates a lot of force. But remember, within that woman is also leaf. And that woman can take you. If she's excited, if you don't have to control her, can take you down. And then Samson will be defeated. Blind. Because he couldn't control the forces of Lilith or the, the, the Laila, the Lilith. The mysteries of Runcaum go to shine in the bottom of the ark, awaiting for the instant for them to be accomplished. This is the mystery of Baphomet. The rose elaborates its perfume with the day with the clay of the earth. The slithering worm does not like the gardener who removes his clay. That worm is the ego. It's lust inside of us. Our disciples will now comprehend on what basis do the tenebrous ones qualify the sexual alchemists as thieves. So this really is a beautiful rune that teaches a lot. Here we find a graphic of King Arthur with Winnever and Lancelot. Lancelot, Tifereth, the human soul. Arthur, the king, Hesed, the innermost. And Winnever, the divine soul that is with both of them. This is Kaum. So behold here the mystery of Scalibur, the sword, and the mystery of the woman, Winnever. All of that history, or story, and closes all the alchemy, the alchemical work that we have to perform. Talking about women, female bodies, you find that Matthew Samael explains in the Ignis Rose, woman has the same rights as men, talking about the physical body. Because there are many people that think that only the male's physical body reached higher levels of spirituality. No, it doesn't matter. You are man or, or, or female, you can reach the higher level. Even a Christification. Woman also reaches the level of adept of the white fraternity. Joan of Arc is a master of major mysteries of the white fraternity. Madame Blavatsky, author of the secret doctrine, reaches the level of adept and she is a master of major mysteries of the white fraternity. In almost all the temples of the mysteries, we find many female adepts working for humanity. Woman awakes her sacred serpentine fire in the same way as man. If a woman who is married wants to awake her kundalini, then she must practice sexual magic with her husband. That is a statement in order to comprehend because there are many organizations outside that uh, when a woman wants to practice sexual magic and is married, uh, they say that they should practice with, with her guru. I mean, it's adultery. There are many black tantra there in the internet, in many other parts of this planet Earth right now, where people are trying to work with the Kundalini, but with adultery. That doesn't work. What they develop is a Kunda buffer, which is the outcome of the Poisoninoskirian vibrations. So you see, in this day and age, you have to control your poisonous vibrations, your children that we have inside, children of the dark, 
of desire, you're yelled about. And uh, to destroy them by comprehending your ego in meditation. That's the path. Comprehension and annihilation. And uh, the path of the perfect matrimony. Do you have questions? Yeah, well, the Kaum, the internal police, relates to Kaum. Are you seeing? It's only one letter there missing, or oh, change it, right? Kaum, Kaum. The internal police is the Kaum, which relates, of course, with Gebura. And the Rune Kaum, or Kaum, relates to Gebura as well. That's why in the Kaum, in, the, in Gebura, you find... The Valkyrias, those women warriors that ride horses in heaven, hmm, which are children of uh, Wotan or Odin. And of course, those are the ones that exercise the, like the divine police. So the Kaom is an archetype that is within the spiritual soul which is your right twin soul because when we talk about the twin souls we have to understand that the innermost has two souls the spiritual and the human we are the human soul or an embryo of a human soul because in order to be really the human soul we have to build astral body mental body and causal body when we created already those bodies, then we said we are the human soul. And my wife, my twin soul, is Kaum, the Valkyria, the spiritual soul inside of me. That's the authentic twin soul. But in this physical world, physically, you have to marry also a twin soul. But we will say it relates to the other level in which you find as a man a woman that have the same longings that you have that feel the same that you feel that think the same that you think and that you feel that uh, alchemical attraction when you are naked with her you like her physically but you have to love her with chastity and that's precisely the mystery. That's the other mystery of the twin souls. Because there are many mysteries. But in relation with this uh, lecture, the twin souls are first, the first level inside. To reach that level and to only to know your spiritual soul, that is a long path. Very long. But here, of course, uh, that part of that soul is the Kaom, the internal police. When you do something wrong, which is not related with that love to your spirituality, that Kaom goes and accuses you. That Kaom is the one that says, you have exchanged your true love for Nahema, for many women in the physical plane. So now you have to receive your punishment. Now you know your twin soul. But in the past you were committing adultery with many women. And that is Karma Zaya. So the police of karma says now you have to be punished. Because that karma is not forgiven. This is how the initials of it suffer in the path. Because you enter. But don't think that because you enter into the path. Oh your karma is for, for, for God. You know? All the adultery that you committed in the past. In past lives. Always want to be forgotten because Jesus is a savior and forgive you. No, I'm sorry. It's not like that. You have to face your own karma. And Kaom is inside of you. 
That is why it's part of the spiritual soul. Spiritual soul says, this is my human soul now, but he betrayed me. Come, come to me. And Kaom says, yeah, it's true. And then Kaom takes the book and says, here, in this life he was doing this, and this life he was doing that, and that, and that, and that. And number all the adulteries that you committed in previous and present life. So in other words, we are bad, <laughs> condemned to death. And that's why we have to die, psychologically. Let him be dead. Let him be dead or let him die. Yeah, you have questions here? The question, you know, the partner has to have the same uh, beliefs. <coughs> well, the partner has to understand what is the path. And it doesn't matter what religion. Because this path that we are spending here is in Christianity, is in Judaism, is in Brahmanism, is in, in Buddhism. It's playing in different manners. This is not a property of Gnosticism. That's why when we study Gnosticism, we study all religions. Because every master explained that in his own level. Mohammed, in his Quran, explained that. But you have to know the mystery of Quran and the arcana of that religion. So it doesn't matter as long as the partner understand that Gnosis is the synthesis of all religions. Then you can practice, of course. doesn't matter. Another? I hope you hear all that <laughs> question. It's very long. Well, the explanation is, are, are we going to, when we start in, sim, in synthesis, when we start doing the work that we have to do, we start as animals. Paul of Tarsus states in, in his letters in the New Testament, first is the animal and then the spiritual. Do not start practicing sexual magic like you are a saint. Because even if you think and you are faking sanctity, inside of you is the lust, big like a pig, like a gorilla. What you have to do is to transmute desire, that animal. That Remember that, that in the beginning God was gathering all those living creatures. Desire is one of them, the animal kingdom. You have to be there, but control it. Desire in the beginning, it has to be transmuted into willpower. Later on, when you advance a lot, you will be without desire performing your sexual act. This comes or brings into my mind an uh, anecdote with the masters of my own door. We arrive at his, uh, at his home with all his students, three females that at that time were single and longing to find a partner and learning to start the work. So they were talking with the master Samael on the or and one of them asked him, I would like to see if you can tell me if I will find my husband because really I want to war with it in order to advance in this path. And then the master says, so you want to find your husband? You want a man like this, he says, because this is a man that maybe you think, a Gnostic, which is very advanced. He will be with you, connected, like a statue. His followers will be erected inside of you and transmuting. Do you like that? Oh, no, she said, no, no. Because she had this desire there, she said, well... Since you are not advanced, for a devil, another devil that will like the path. But both of them have to transmute with desire in the beginning. Because if you want to start without desire, well, desire is inside of you. 
So you have to learn to teach the physical body how to transmute desire into willpower. And little by little, you have to defeat desire and to kill even the shadow of desire and reach the moment in which, like a St. Francis of Assis, St. Francis of Assisi, that will perform the sexual act there without, without desire. But the one that will give him the strength in order to do it will be Lucifer, the sexual potency. But in the beginning, any, any uh, initiate, any beginner, any neophyte, start with desire and Lucifer also. And that is the problem. Because Lucifer is there and Lilith as well. So you have to fight against us. But uh, anyone that has that courage will do it. All the great prophets did it. And we are doing it. But all of us started fighting very hard. And still, because the battle ends until you die psychologically completely. 100%. Do you have another question? Yes? Do you give uh, an exercise for one of the runes? Is there an, a practice for the other rune? The other rune, a practice for the rune Kaum. Well, the rune Thorn uh, is, I gave you already. The, the other is well, Kaum, you have to have your wife. Then you will do the, 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 that practice. The mystery of the rune Kaum is sexual magic. If you are a woman, then you need a man. And that will be the practice of the rune Kaum. Sexual connection, husband and wife. That will be the honeymoon. To transmute and learn to be united with your twin soul. If you are still uh, single, well, continue doing your pranayamas and other exercises, runic exercises that will put in activity that sexual energy. Because if you are just abstained of the sexual act without doing exercises, you will develop poisoninoskivian vibrations. And that is not visible. Behold the Catholic priests, that they were just avoiding that and uh, they develop anomalies within their psyche. Thank you very much. To learn more about what you learned in this lecture, we invite you to explore the books published by Glorian Publishing, available from booksellers worldwide. You may also be interested in online courses or upcoming retreats, all of which you can learn about at GnosticTeachings.org. All of this has been made possible by the financial support of listeners like you. Will you help others to benefit from this knowledge? Most spiritual schools recommend a donation of $10 to $20 per lecture. Every donation helps. Make a donation now at GnosticTeachings.org. Thank you. May all beings be happy. Yeah,